Today we have a guest speaker. We decided for the 40th anniversary that we would probably have a guest speaker that would give me some time to digest my cake and uh, to be able to do all that. And so I do want to say, uh, as our guest speaker comes up, uh, be patient with him, uh, be merciful. Um, he's kind of new at this thing, and um, yeah. <laughs> Probably help Max if I turn on my mic. Thank you, Max. You, yeah. <laughs> 35 years I preached, nobody stood up. I come back one time and the whole place stands up. So great. Sure good, sure good to see you all. You know, people ask Carla and me all the time, what's it like being out there? Because we're speaking a lot of places. And I said, you know what? There's Dorothy got it right. There's no place like home. And uh, so good to be here today. Thank you. One of the most uh, often asked questions while we're out and about is, uh, are you enjoying retirement? We say, yep, we are, um, parts of it anyway. And we, uh, we are out serving the Lord, doing various things with our district. Uh, Converge Pack West used to be a Baptist General Conference. We're part of a movement. Our church here is part of a movement that they're committed to starting churches, strengthening churches, and also sending missionaries, which is what Golden Hills has been about from the very beginning. So it's fun to be a part of that. People say, where do you live? We still live in Antioch, same house we've been in for 40 years or so. And what are you doing? Well, I mentioned we do mentor coaching for our district denomination with about 80-something churches in Northern California, Nevada, and Hawaii. So we have a lot to keep us busy, but one of our best things that we enjoy is a little more time when we have it to spend with our kids and uh, with our seven grandchildren. Can you imagine that? Seven grandchildren God's given us. So we're grateful. So thank you for your prayers. You know, uh, on a 40th anniversary, it's a great time to remember what God has done. And there are many, many people to thank through the years who have paid the price, who've prayed the prayers, who've given and served and done so many things that God has used. And many of you are part of that now. That's why the church is where it is. But it's God who gets the glory because he's the one who started and he's the one who sees us through. And so today, as we are celebrating, um, we want to make sure that all the credit goes to him. And I'm so thankful that um, our church has always been committed to the gospel. And one of the things I appreciate most about Pastor Phil, I tell people all the time, honestly, he's the best Bible teacher in the whole area. If you're here, you're going to get the truth. You're going to get the word. The gospel is going to be faithfully preached, and people are going to know who God is and what his plan is for the world. So I'm so thankful that <laughs> Phil is still leading that effort and uh, grateful for what he's doing in you and through you. A couple of weeks ago, or last week actually, Phil started a new series, Revitalize a People Restored and Rebuilding. And so when Phil asked me to come and share today, he said, could you take Ezra chapter 1 as we begin into this series of Ezra, Haggai, and Nehemiah, a story of restored people and a God who rebuilds. And so if you have your Bibles today, um, I'll be reading out of the ESV in honor of Phil. Uh, <laughs> He used to call this the extra spiritual version. I lean a little heavier towards the NIV, and I tell him it's the naturally inspired version. So we, we go back and forth all the time. But many of you are, are doing ESV, and it's a great, great translation. So I'll be reading out of that today. Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. 
He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah, and this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylon, Babylonia to Jerusalem. Let's pray for a minute. God, this is your word. You spoke it clearly to Ezra, and he wrote it down, knowing that on this day, September 10th, 2023, we'd be opening this up again to hear you speak. And that's what we need today. We need to hear you speak. I need to hear you speak. These dear people don't need to hear from me, God. Yours is the voice we want to hear. This is your word. So please bring it alive in our hearts today. Let us see and know in the depth of our being you're a sovereign and good God. and We can trust you. A God who keeps his promises. A God who fulfills his every purpose. In our lives, for his people, and for the church. And we'll thank you for all that you'll show us today in Jesus' name. Amen. It was October of 2017 when the Tubbs fire raged through parts of Napa, Sonoma, and Lake Counties. 22 people lost their lives. 7,000 structures were destroyed. 5,300 of them was somebody's home. 36,807 acres were charred like a barren landscape at a cost of over $1.3 billion. One of our good friends and fellow pastors told of a harrowing escape they made that night out of Santa Rosa as they got their family together, got in the car, and just made it barely through the flames. When they were allowed to return, they showed a video of them driving down the road back to their neighborhood where once 1,100 homes had stood. All of them were gone. As they drove in that video into their driveway, all that remained of their house and everything that they had was a smoldering foundation. And I remember asking Mike at that time, what are you and Zoe going to do? He said, by God's grace, we're going to rebuild. God called us here, and he wants to use us to help restore this neighborhood. Carla and I visited Mike and Zoe a while after that in their beautiful new home. It took two years for it to be reconstructed. And Mike told me the other day, he said, Larry, of those 1,100 homes, others have come to rebuild. Over 90% of them have now been restored. And God used the church in that community to help impact everybody with the gospel. Santa Rosa became a story of a revitalized people, a people that were restored and were rebuilding, and they still are. You know, in a very similar way, but much more important way, that's what the books of Ezra and Haggai and Nehemiah are all about. A revitalized people restored and rebuilding after 70 years of exile 
and captivity in Babylon. You know, to revitalize something means to bring back vitality and vigor after a period of decline or a period of setback. And in Ezra, Haggai, and Nehemiah, you have the story of one of the greatest comebacks, one of the greatest revitalizations God has ever done. Last week, Pastor Phil did a great job laying out the background of why they were in captivity in the first place and what led up to what some would call the second great exodus from that exile. God made a covenant with his people through Moses. You remember that? He would set the ground rules for life with him in the promised land. The terms of the Mosaic covenant were really simple. Blessings if you obey and live in faithfulness with God and curses and the loss of everything you know if you don't. So the people turned away from God. Even though God raised up prophets to keep reminding them, you don't want to do that. But they ignored him anyway. So the terms of the covenant kicked in. They were removed from the land. And eventually their temple, their palaces, their homes, even the walls were torn down and Jerusalem was destroyed. As Phil reminded us last week, in this second wave of people when Nebuchadnezzar came back, he cleaned out everybody but the poorest people. In the first wave, he took Jehoiachin, people like Ezekiel and Daniel would play significant roles amongst the captives in Babylon. But God wasn't done with his people. God sent a letter to the exiles through Jeremiah to give them a hope and a future. It's amazing. God recorded for us what that letter said in Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when, it, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations, all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you in the exile. God told the people, look, you're going to be in Babylon a while, so settle down, get married, have children, seek the welfare of the place where you're living. Don't listen to the false prophets that are telling you your stay is going to be short. It isn't. Seventy years years you're going to be there until my promises and my purposes are complete. And then I will bring you back to the land, revitalized, restored, and rebuilding. And the story of that restoration and rebuilding begins really in Ezra chapter 1. Ezra was a priest and a scribe. As a priest, you might interest you to know he was a direct descendant from Moses' brother Aaron, the first and great high priest. And also he was a scribe, which doesn't mean he just recorded down what other people said. A scribe in Ezra's day meant someone who was a Bible scholar, learned, trained, and expert in the scriptures. Ezra lived in the 5th century B.C. He was born in 480 B.C. He lived 40 years. Ezra wasn't even alive when Cyrus gave his edict that he was writing about. Ezra was writing history. And later on, he would become a part of that history. He lived among the exiles in Babylon during the time of the Persian rule, the Persians who conquered the Babylonians. The Persian king Cyrus came to power in 559. 21 years later, he issued this edict. He said, under the command of God. So in 538, he declared that everybody that wanted to could go back and be a part of rebuilding God's temple. And Ezra records this great second exodus where nearly 50,000 people accepted the opportunity. And they returned with Zerubbabel, their governor. 58 years later, Ezra himself would return. 13 years after that, Nehemiah would come to restore the walls and strengthen the people. And in the middle of it all, God would raise up a guy like Haggai to encourage the people to finish what God had them start. 
The writings of Ezra, Haggai, and Nehemiah testify to the fact that God is a covenant-keeping God who restores and rebuilds his covenant people. But why does he do that? Why does he restore and rebuild his people? To fulfill his covenant promises, Isaiah said, I mean, excuse me, Ezra said, and to fulfill his covenant purposes. God restores and rebuilds his covenant people to fulfill his covenant promises. Ezra put it like this in verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods, with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. God is a sovereign and good God whom we can trust to always fulfill his every word. By the way, you hear banging stuff once in a while. That's my fault, not anybody else's. I have a lot of quirks when I speak. Some of you have been around a while. You remember them. My voice cracks once in a while. I sound like I'm going through puberty. I occasionally do this with my pants. I had a lady once tell me, Pastor, do you know it's so distracting when you are hitching up your pants like that? And I said, with all due respect, ma'am, how much would it distract you if I didn't hitch him up? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so all the cracking and the bangs, you get used to it. And if you're new, thank you for putting up with it. When our kids were little, Carla used to be very involved with them in public school. She'd bring her guitar, George, sing to the kids. She'd always be in the classroom. She'd pick them up from school, take them to school. So one day, she asked me to pick up our daughter, Kelsey, from kindergarten. I thought, yeah, I can do that. So I told Kelsey, hey, Kelsey, tomorrow daddy's going to pick you up from school, so I want you to be watching for me. Okay, daddy. Well, the hour to pick her up came. I was running late, and I realized I ain't going to make it on time. So I raced. I mean, well, if there's any police officers here, I hurriedly, carefully across town (laughs) to the pickup spot. When I got there, all the cars are gone. All the good parents had already picked their kids up. So I jumped out of the car, ran to the gate, and I saw Kelsey sitting alone on the ground, cross-legged by the door, open door that went to her kindergarten classroom. And I'm thinking, she's going to be so scared. She's all alone. She's the last one. She's going to be so upset. She'll never trust me again. I'll never walk her down the aisle at her wedding. I'm thinking all these things. (laughs) As I approached, I could hear her singing. And as I got closer, she saw me, and she jumped up and said, Hi, Daddy. I said, Oh, Kelsey, I'm so, so sorry that I'm late. I have no excuse. You're all alone. Were you scared? She said, nope, I wasn't scared because you said you would come. And I learned that day a powerful lesson about the importance of keeping my word if I'm going to build trust with my children. And later as I thought about that whole exchange, I thought, I thought, Lord, how is it that my daughter can have such a confidence in the word of her very flawed father? But I at times, along with others, we have a time, a hard time sometimes, of trusting your word. You never make a mistake. The exiles of Judah and Benjamin We're about to be reminded of a valuable truth. God makes promises and he keeps them because he is sovereign and he is good. And that's really important to know both of those because if God is sovereign but he isn't good, we have a problem. 
Because now we have a God who controls all things, but he ain't good. And it's not going to be good for us. But if he's good, but he isn't sovereign, he may love us and care for us and want all the best for us, but he can't control everything because he's not sovereign. He doesn't, he doesn't handle everything. He doesn't have the power to do it. But if he's sovereign and he's good, we have the God that we have who loves us and is sovereign and does all things well. The exiles were about to learn that lesson. So when God uses Ezra the scribe to record Cyrus's edict, he's careful to tie it back to the fulfillment of the promise that God gave through Jeremiah. That's why he wrote in Ezra 1 verse 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. God's word spoken through Jeremiah was about to be fulfilled. God keeps his promises. What was the word through Jeremiah? Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. What did God say? I will fulfill to you my promise bring you back to this place. But it wasn't just a promise to bring them back to, play, to that place. He said, I'm also going to restore you and restore you back to me and all that you've lost. He went on to say in Jeremiah 29, verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I'll hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So God promised him, I'm not only going to restore you back to the land, I'm going to restore you with me, and I'm going to restore what you have lost. So that's exactly what he did. He stirred up Cyrus's heart. He stirred up the hearts of the people who would go back to actually do and participate in this. And he stirred up all the people who would help send them with what they would need to get the job done. All to restore his people and to rebuild a temple and to rebuild their lives with him just as he had promised. But it wasn't just the promise to bring them back to the land and restore them to himself and what they had lost. It was a promise that it would also be through the king named Cyrus. This is amazing. In the first year, Ezra said, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing. The year that Cyrus came to power was 559 B.C. But about 140 years prior to that, about 700 B.C., God used Isaiah to tell the people that when my promise is fulfilled, it's going to be done through a king, my servant, my anointed one named Cyrus. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. He's describing this future Cyrus and what God's going to do to bring him to power. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. Cyrus's mom never had a chance. She was going to name her boy Cyrus. <laughs> I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all things. So, 
when Cyrus issued his edict, isn't it interesting, he's the one who said, it's the Lord, the God of heaven, who has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. I'm issuing this edict because God has told me to do this. Amazing. So when Ezra writes the history of that time, five times in the first chapter, he said it was Cyrus. 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 But it wasn't just about bringing them back to the land. It wasn't just a promise to help them be restored to him and all they had lost. It wasn't just a promise it's going to be a guy named Cyrus. But God also kept his promise to continue the line of David until the coming of his David's greater son, Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 33, verse 14. God said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely, and this is the name by which it will be called the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. So, God said, David, there's going to be a continuation of your line all the way to the Messiah. And I'm going to do that, I promise. As Pastor Phil pointed out last week, it wasn't looking good for that promise. You remember it was King Jehoiachin, also called Jeconiah, also called Coniah. He was the one that was in power when Jerusalem fell. They, Nebuchadnezzar took him and put him in prison where he stayed for 37 years. And when you read the biblical chronology, it looks like the line is done. The last line of David, Jehoiachin, he's in prison. So how is God going to keep his promise? This is what you read in 2 Kings 25, verse 27. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Merodach, also called Amel Marduk, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put off his prison garments. Every day of his life, he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, according to his daily needs, as long as he lived. Jehoiachin was 18 when he came to power. He reigned three months Nebuchadnezzar took him and threw him in prison for 37 years. He was 55 when he got out. But before he died, he had a son named Sheltiel. And Sheltiel had a son, the grandson of Jehoiachin, in the direct bloodline of David. His name was Zerubbabel, the one that God raised up as the governor to go and return with the people to lead them in the rebuilding of the temple. Zerubbabel, Jehoiachin's grandson, in the line of David would be the fulfillment of God's promise. This is why the genealogical record given by Matthew when he outlined the genealogy of David's line, fulfilling the promise of God. He wrote in Matthew 1 verse 12, And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah, Jehoiachin, was the father of Sheltiel, and Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Eliud, Eliud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. Keeps every promise. And that's why Ezra was careful to say in Ezra 2, which uh, Phil will be picking up later, he was very careful to say in Ezra 2.2, 2, oh, and they came with Zerubbabel. God is a God who keeps his promises. He knows how to fill them because he's sovereign and he's good. 
You see, Ezra knew the prophecies. He knew the promises. He knew the word. That's why he also knew what Joshua said when the people came out of Egypt through 40 years of wilderness wanderings, finally to the promised land. Joshua 23, verse 14, Joshua said, And now I am about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Ezra knew the promises of God had never failed, and they never would. And that's important because God has made a promise in the new covenant, instituted and assured by the blood of Jesus shed on a cross. A covenant he promised through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and with Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. This is why an old sinner like me, and I don't say that lightly, an old sinner like me that's been saved by God's amazing grace, when I hold that cup of communion in my hand, I'm holding the cup of his promise. Jesus took the cup that night at the Last Supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's given for you. It's poured out for the forgiveness of many. The promise is that if we confess our sins and believe that God's good news of the gospel, that there's salvation in Christ and him alone, that all of us have sinned and fall short of his glory, then in a great act of grace and mercy, he poured out his own life on a cross. He shed his blood there for me. And it accomplished my atonement and my propitiation, the payment for my sin and the appeasement of God's wrath. My sin and God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. And God said, if you believe that, then this new covenant is for you. And one day, God's going to keep another promise. You trust in him, you will be saved. You'll be saved from sin and death and the grave. And you'll be more alive than you've ever known. This is God's covenant promise. But there's another part of that promise. He's coming again. He's coming back to get us. And either on the day of your death or the day of his great and glorious appearing, somehow he's going to do it. He's going to come back and take each of us or if he comes back with a great shout, all of us together. However he does it, he's coming back. And he said, I'm going to take you to be where I am in my father's house. Is that really going to happen? I guarantee it. Because God is a sovereign, good God who makes and keeps his promises. Jesus is coming again. All of his promises will be fulfilled. They are all yes in Christ Jesus. But it's not just that he keeps his promises. These exiles needed to learn also that God is a God who rebuilds his covenant people to fulfill his covenant purposes. He went on to say in Ezra 1 verse 5, Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them, 
aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. And Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazzar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them. You can see it all there. 5,400 vessels. All these did Sheshbazzar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. God will stir up whomever he chooses to fulfill his eternal purposes. Forty years ago, when God wanted a new church in Antioch, Brentwood, he started stirring up a lot of people. Some of these people are names you need to remember, not for their glory, but for God's glory. But there's a lot of people who paid the price and are still paying it, like some of you, to serve the Lord Jesus and to keep advancing his gospel and his kingdom until he comes. It's impossible to mention all of their names. There's too many. But there was a very vibrant visionary core group in the beginning. Some of their names are listed on the charter membership you might see hanging out there. Names that I don't ever want to forget that I'm grateful for. Like, like Pastor Harold Carlson and Pastor Gerald Dirksen and his wife Leah from Fair Oaks Concord, our mother church. That, by the way, is celebrating their 67th anniversary today. People like Cheryl and Wynn Philpott who opened up their home for the first set of Bible studies. Don and Edith Ketchum, Ray and Thelma McCauley, Dick and Laura McCauley, Martin and Vanjie Loy, Greg and Gail Burt, Chuck and Ethel Selberg, Leon and Bernice Archambault, Ralph Fossil, Gloria Ichikawa, and Alan Ichikawa, Gloria Thompson, Phil and Belinda Height, a whole mess of others. I can't mention all their names, but I wish I could. Because as a member of Golden Hills, I owe them a lot. We don't ever want to forget our history or to be slow to thank the people whom God has used or to be slow to you thank the people whom God is using right now like you to continue building what he said he would do. God gets the glory, but he uses people to accomplish his purpose. And that's why he stirred up things like he did there in Babylon. Golden Hills has always been a Christ-centered, gospel-driven missionally minded church and I can't tell you how thrilled that Carl and I are that they are still that today and by God's grace we always will be so when this amazing group of people who wanted to start this church in Antioch came to us in May of 1983 to ask Carl and me if we'd be willing to help pastor and lead this new church I told them no <laughs> not now I'm living in Oregon. I like it up there. I want to build a house. I want to, I want to be a youth pastor. I want to, I want to, I want to. It's embarrassing. But those folks never asked anyone else. God had stirred up their hearts to say, those are the people, just wait, they'll come around. <laughs> so they kept in touch with us all summer long. Asking us, well, what should we name the church? How should we do this? What should we do with this and that? And I'm thinking, what? Why are these people doing this? Don't they get it? September 13, 1983, they have their first service. An old Lutheran church building downtown at 19th and Street. See, Carla's dad, Cully Olson, came and spoke that morning. If you ever heard him speak, boy, wow. 110 people came that day, and the church was born. So after they had the first service, they called Carla and me and said, hey, we want you to come back and take another look at this. And I'm thinking, good night. I said, Carla, we got to go down and shut this thing down. These people are delusional. We ain't moving. 
So they invite us to come back and speak on Sunday. So it's Saturday night. I'm supposed to speak the next day. We're staying, Carl and I are over at the Motel 6 in Pittsburgh. It ain't Oregon, let me tell you. <laughs> and I was miserable because I know God was stirring me up to do this, but I didn't want to do it. So Carla says to me that night, Larry, I think the reason you're so miserable is God wants you to do this. You're not willing. I hate it when God speaks to me through my wife like that. <laughs> Because she's right, and I knew it. So I got up and left the room, closed the door firmly behind me, and I went for a walk in the Motel 6 parking lot. The gas trucks were driving by. The smell of the refinery was in the air. Trash was literally blowing around my feet. And I looked up at the moon, and I started to pray to God. I never heard the audible voice of God, ever. But God has a way of speaking to you if you're listening. And all he said to me that night was, Larry, you don't want to take this? That's your choice. Don't call me Lord again. And it broke me. And I went back in the room, and I said, Carla, look. I don't know what God's going to do, but I can't say no. He's the Lord of my life. He stirred us up with a lot of other people. We got to come. So the next day when I spoke, I still remember saying to the people, I, I picked up my Bible and I said, look, you don't know how to be a church. I don't know how to be a pastor. So why don't we take this book and ask God to show us together what he wants to do? And Golden Hills has followed that from the very beginning. Taking the book and asking God, what do you want to do? That's what God did when he stirred up the people in Babylon to come back to build the temple. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Or in verse 5, then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem. When the people came back, they weren't all that enthusiastic about building the temple. So God had to raise up Haggai to stir him up again. Haggai 1, verse 13, Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the son, the son of Sheltiel and the governor of Judah and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, those who came back. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord. Their God, the Lord of hosts, their God. He stirred them up. He literally woke them up. He aroused them to action is what the word means. So God stirred them all up as he does when he's getting ready to do something through the people he wants to use. All the people have to do is remember to say yes. So that's why Cyrus said that his purpose in issuing the edict was to go back to fulfill God's purpose to rebuild the temple. Verse 2, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. God's charged me to do this. He's given me the kingdoms of the world, and he's given me authority to issue this. I'm telling you, God has charged me. He's visited me with intent. He's appointed me for a purpose. You're going back, and you're going to rebuild God's temple. Because God wasn't just restoring a building. He was restoring a people to be his very own. A people that he wanted to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. A light of revelation to the nations. The temple was the visible center of God's presence. He departed in Ezekiel 10 when the people were sinning. 
the building was destroyed, God said, I want you to rebuild it because I want to come back and be the center of your worship. I want to be the center of your lives. Remember when they came out of Egypt the first time in the first Exodus, what God told Moses? Exodus 25, have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. As one commentator put it, this command remained valid and failure to rebuild the temple would have been tantamount to saying they did not want God dwelling among them. Or at least they didn't care. Far from being a re ritualistic and legalistic activity, the building of the temple and the accompanying sacrifices was a response to grace. The obedience involved in following God's commands to build a house is an act of faith that God would keep his promise to dwell with them. Thus, the temple was not a cultic center, but a place where God, whom the highest heavens cannot contain, was pleased to dwell among his people. So God raised up the prophet Haggai. Because you see, the people came back from captivity and they were all about building their own houses and getting in the landscaping, putting in the pool, picking out the drapes, getting the furniture. They made everything great for themselves, but they weren't doing what God sent them to do. So God says, look, man, you guys, you're seeing crops fail and you're seeing all kinds of climate change, God's climate change. By the way, God controls the climate. Just thought I'd tell you that. But you're seeing the dew dry up. You're seeing the droughts that are coming, the grain, the new wine, the oil, and what, what's happening. I, you're seeing all this stuff amounting to nothing, and you're wondering why. So Haggai says in Haggai 1, uh, 1 verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills, bring the wood, build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. So it says in verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared the Lord. That edict from Haggai, or that message from Haggai, is said to have come about 520 B.C. Four years later, the temple was done. God stirred up his people through the prophet to finish what he told them to start. And one of the things I'm so grateful for is that I see God finishing at Golden Hills through you. What he promised in the beginning, he would start. And as long as you keep your eyes on the Lord and keep doing what he prompts you to do, God's hand will be with you, stirring people up to fulfill his eternal purpose. So the people returned to the work temple was finished. Ezra would return later and be used of God to lead a great revival amongst them. Nehemiah would come 13 years after that, and he'd help rebuild the walls and strengthen the people. And God is still restoring and rebuilding people to be his very own. Because you see, the temple is where God resides. For them, it was to be a building where his presence would be, and all the nations could come there. That's why the temple had a court called the Court of the Nations, the Court of the Gentiles. When Jesus cleansed the temple, it wasn't just because they were selling stuff in there. The Jews had set up the Court of the Gentiles and taken it over so the nations couldn't come anymore. And he was furious. You were called to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and you've turned my house into a house of robbers. So he chased them out. God lives in his temple today. Jesus said, I'm the temple. And so when he comes to live in you and you believe, you become his temple. And when Jesus comes to dwell in a church united together for his glory and his purpose, the church is his temple. And God intends for we, each individually and his church corporately, to be the place where his glory shines to the nations. That all people will know that God is God who has given his life to save people from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. People next door, people around the world, we are God's temple today in which God lives and shines his glory for all to see. Amen. 
This is why Peter declared that we have become God's people for God's purpose. We have a new identity. We live to fulfill that purpose. God fulfilling it through us. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, amongst the nations honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. People, if you live for Jesus in the world the way he's asking us to live, we are not to be offensive. But people will at times think we're different. It was meant to be that way. Because Jesus wants people to see him in us. To know that we are not of this world. We belong to a different kingdom and a different king. When I first traveled on business out of New England, the first place I went, I'd never been out of New England. The first place I went was to New Orleans, Louisiana. You talk about a cultural shock. I got up the next day to go down for breakfast. I ordered I ordered eggs and hammer sausage or something and some toast. The lady comes, plops my plate down, and there's a pile of white sand on my plate. I called the lady over, and I said, ma'am, there's a pile of white sand on my plate. She said, boy, those are grits. <laughs> and then she said, you ain't from around here, are you, boy? The greatest compliment the world can ever give is to see your life lived out for Jesus and Christ living out through you. And they say to you, you know, you're not from around here, are you? No, you're right, I'm not. I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. I belong to a different king. And I live for a different kingdom. See, the purpose of rebuilding the temple was so that God would be the centerpiece of all of their worship. The reason Jesus comes to live in us is that he would still be the center of all of our worship. And so when he sent us out with the Great Commission, what did he say? He said, hey, he said I want you to go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. I'm so glad Golden Hills is still being God's people, living out what God called them to do for his purpose. You know, God is sovereign and he is good. And he loves revitalizing his people by restoring and rebuilding their lives. As Carla and I serve the churches where he calls us to serve, there's evidence of God rebuilding and revitalization and restoring going on all over the place. Like Golden Hills, most churches, especially in California, are feeling the effects of the winds of change and circumstance. As Pastor Phil mentioned last week, 9-11 changed everything for us. The recent COVID pandemic changed a lot of things for us. The exodus from California, pastoral transitions, changes in community demographics, a global pandemic, all of these things have affected the churches we're working with, and Golden Hills is no exception. But many congregations are rebuilding. They're being restored. People are coming back. And if Carla and I travel around, we see evidence of it everywhere. Some churches have closed up, but new churches have sprung up in their place. Some are hanging on, but they're slowly recovering. Others have been rebuilding in strategic ways, seeing more people coming to Christ than before all these things. One church we work with has baptized over 100 people during COVID while they met outdoors. God is at work. And it isn't just what he's doing to restore and rebuild his church corporately, it's what he's doing to rebuild and restore each of our lives who trust him. We meet so many people who say, you know what? 
I've done so many things wrong, I don't think God could ever rebuild my life. My mom was one of those. I keep sharing Christ with her, and she'd say, I just a few things i got to clean up before God will accept me. No, you got it backwards, Mom. You can't clean it up. God loves you. He gave a price for you. He's the one who wants to restore you. He's the one that wants to rebuild your life. He's the one who wants to forgive you. People, if you're here today and you ever believed the lie that God can't use you because you've sinned so much and failed so much that you've blown it beyond his reach, I want to tell you something. Nobody's beyond his reach. He loves you. You come back to him in obedience, believe the gospel, come back to this Jesus. He will take your life. He will restore it. He will rebuild it over time. He can help rebuild your life. He can help rebuild your marriage. He can help rebuild your family. He can help rebuild a church. He can help rebuild a nation because he's sovereign and he's good. He did it for the exiles. He can do it for all of us if we are called to believe his promise and fulfill his purpose. As Golden Hills begins its next chapter of ministry, a 40-year anniversary is a great time to look back with gratitude to what God has done to the people who came before us. But it's also a great time to look in the mirror and see what God wants to do with us right now and believe that God can still use us to make a difference for the future. In the past, God stirred up the right people at the right time in each chapter of our church's history, and he used them as the part of his fulfillment of his promise and his purpose. If you're here right now, and God is stirring you up for anything, to respond to this God in obedience and faith, and to say yes to him, then you come to him and say yes. Don't miss out. Be part of what God's church has always been here. A people growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, focused on Jesus and his gospel, a people after God's own heart who live for the praise of his glory because we believe that God keeps his promises and fulfills his every purpose because he's sovereign and he's good. He hasn't changed. He's the same. He was there before. He's there now, and he always will be. Father, thank you for this day, this time to look back, this time to look at the present, and the time to look forward. Thank you for the people of the past whom you have used to fulfill your purpose. Thank you for the people of the present who are saying yes to you and you're using to continue to fulfill that promise and those purposes. And the people you will yet, yet raise up and stir up to say yes to you. Thank you, God, for all that you have done. It is for your glory. It always has been. It always must be. So I pray, God, that the best years for this church are not behind us. The best years are yet to come. As we grow deeper in our walk with you, as we get behind our pastor and our leadership, God, to look to you to do great and mighty things on our own we could never do, to bring people into the kingdom who come to live for the praise of your glory, as we faithfully seek to let you use our lives to share the good news of your gospel with every people, tribe, language, and nation until you have completed your promise and fulfilled every purpose and returned in great glory to take us home with you. We thank you, God, for all these things today and for allowing us to be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen.